Hi everyone, this is Lori Mantipal from Metastar and I wanted to thank you all for attending today's open office hours. Um, I'm sure that we will have others um, joining us as, as we move along, but I did want to get started here. Um, and before we get started, um, just a couple housekeeping requests. Um, please place your line on mute unless you're asking a question um, or you have a comment to, to, to add. Um, I am going to try to keep um, the lines open um, for as much of the call as we can because we'd like this to be as interactive as possible. Also, feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions or, or to make comments as well. Um, the goal here is really to have a very interactive um, office hours. Um, and today I am joined by Janelle Sapien um, from the Wisconsin Medicaid eHealth Program, and she is also here um, ready to take questions and, uh, you know, um, it provides some information as well. So welcome everyone. And once again, if you are not speaking, um, please go ahead and mute your line just to keep background noise to a minimum. Um, and I just wanted to point out that funding for this webinar is provided by the Health IT Extension Program. Um, on this slide, I do have some additional information um, around our program. Metastar, subsidized through the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, is able to provide grant-funded services around health IT. Um, if you're not currently participating in our program, please consider joining. Um, just reach out to myself or to Metastar. We spend most of our time um, providing one-on-one -on -one assistance to healthcare organizations um, throughout the state of Wisconsin, primarily small organizations. And when your organization is a part participating in the program, um, we're able to design one-on-one -on -one assistance specifically to meet you wherever you are on your health IT journey. We're happy to help share best practices, provide security risk assessment, assist implementing workflows. We are not um, really experts on any one EHR. However, we are very knowledgeable about many EHRs, and, and we are um, vendor neutral. So um, we're able to answer questions and, and probably get you in touch with others around the state who are, who are using um, the same EHR that you have as well. Um, and who is Metastar? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, Metastar is the quality improvement organization for the state of Wisconsin. And in addition to our work um, in the Medicaid Health IT Extension Program, um, we're also able to um, provide assistance for the quality payment program, at least in the world of health IT, I should say. Some of the other work that we do um, in addition to the Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Program, we're also able to provide um, assistance for the quality payment program, including MIPS. Um, here in the state of Wisconsin, specifically, once again, for small, um, rural, underserved um, providers here in the state. Um, without further ado, I'm going to just present just a few basic um, overview, uh, overview points um, about the program year 2019 requirements, and then we'll jump right into any questions you have around these. Um, stage three is required in program year 20, 2019 and beyond. Um, and um, because of that, EPs are required to have 2015 edition certified EHR technology in place for the full 90-day EHR reporting period, and that is at a minimum. Um, you also need to um, report on the stage three objectives for 90 days. Um, and you also need to have a 90-day patient volume report that may, does not need to, but can be the same as that 90-day EHR reporting period. Um, and that needs to show that um, the EP, uh, either using individual or a group methodology, 
has seen over 30% of Medicaid patient volumes or 20% for pediatricians. Um, needed here as well is that you do need to report on six electronic clinical quality measures um, and including an outcome or a high priority um, ECQM. And the program year 2019 applications are now being accepted and they will be through March 31st um, of 2020. And then, as I said before, we really want to keep this to be an open forum for stage three and application questions. However, I thought it would be helpful to have a list as well as each one of these points also um, points you to other resources, um, commonly used resources, kind of my favorite ones. Um, that I have found most useful and answer most of the questions <laughs> um, that, that, that I have been fielding and, and others on the team. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I just wanted to sort of open it up and, and see what kinds of questions people are having. And Janelle, while we're waiting um, for people to sort of think about what questions they may have um, or experiences that they'd like to share with everyone, um, I just think that I'd bring you in and just ask you a little bit about the portal and, and what, do you, what has really changed from previous years, just so that people know what to expect. Sure. Thanks, Laurie. Um, so a couple of things, there's a few new functionalities in the attestation portal this year, which we're pretty excited about. Um, the first one is when you reach your dashboard, your initial dashboard for a provider, um, and it'll show you, you know, this is the normal page that shows you all of the prior application years, and then it allows you to start an application for the current year from this page. When you're looking at that page, on the top, there is um, a note or an indication of what PIN that um, that eligible professional is aligned with, what payee TIN or tax identification number, and that is now going to be hyperlinked. So you can click on that hyperlink and it will actually bring you to a whole list of all of your eligible professionals that are associated with your TIN. So, um, what it, what it does is it provides you this list of those eligible professionals and then it tells you what the most recently completed program year is and what payment year that program year was for. And then it will also tell you what stage it was. So was it stage two, modified stage two, stage three? Um, we get a lot of questions. Um, I know Metastar does as well about, you know, where, where are my providers in the process? Um, maybe maybe it's a you know provide maybe it's a new person too who hasn't um, who isn't as familiar with this and maybe you've got some some question so this is a really nice way to have a full list of all of your eligible professionals that are associated to your payee and or payee tin I do want to note this list will only show up if you have associated that eligible professional to your payee tin on the CMS registration site. So if it's a new eligible professional that's new to your practice, you would first need to go on to the CMS website to switch the registration information over to reflect your clinic, and then you'd be able to see any past attestation history if that provider has attested in Wisconsin in the past. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that one? Janelle, one thing I just wanted to, to mention is that that is one of the resources that I do have a link to right here. That's the CMS Promoting Interoperability Programs Registration System. And you know, that's just an excellent feature that, that you just mentioned that, um, that is new to the portal this year. Are there any other things that you wanted to, um, to highlight? Yeah, okay. actually, no. yeah. There, there is some new functionality as well. Um, when you are entering in your meaningful use measures, um, historically, you would have to go in measure by measure and you'd sort of go into a screen and then you would exit out of the screen. Go into a screen, exit out of the screen. 
it was not um, the most fluid process. And so what we really wanted to do with stage three was find a way to help you all in your attestations to make it a more fluid process for you. So instead what happens now when you click to enter in your meaningful use measures, it pulls up a, a screen for you to enter things in. However, it takes you from one objective to the next um, just automatically. And it, you can skip one if you aren't ready to enter in one, and then it'll take you back to that one before exiting out. Um, it's just a little bit, you know, the screens themselves, they're going to look very similar to what they had in the past where they have the objective and measure language, any exclusions available, and then it'll ask you if you met the measure, and then to input your numerator and denominator if that's applicable. Um, but it just moves you across, it moves you through the measures a little bit more efficiently um, instead of having to go in and out of screens. So that's one. Um, the other thing is that for the meaningful, or excuse me, for the electronic clinical quality measures, um, there's that same mechanism that I just spoke of where you would select what measures you want and then it'll kind of take you through um, in a little bit more of a, a fluid fashion. Um, but the other thing I want to mention is Lori had noted that this year providers do have to submit one outcome or otherwise high priority electronic clinical quality measure. Um, in a, you know, as a part of their total of six ECQMs. So for the, for the screen for that, um, the system is set up so it has all of the outcome measures in one box at the top. You can choose what outcome measures um, you want to attest to. If there are none there, then it has another box that has all of the high priority measures. Again, you can choose one or more of theirs. Um, and then it has all of the rest of the measures in another box. So it makes it a little bit easier for you to figure out, you know, have I met that one, have I met this requirement by CMS that I'm attesting to one outcome or high priority measure because they're all neatly in separate boxes for you to see that. Mm -hmm. Janelle, this is Lori and I just did want to mention that, um, you know, when I was attesting with a provider, that, that's one of the things that we really found useful. And for those of you who, you know, I, I remember when we got there, it's like, oh my gosh, which ones are those um, right offhand? And just for everyone who um, is on the call, I, um, I, I do have that link opened here. And as Mel said, those, um, <clears throat> those high priority and outcome measures really neatly, the moment that you go into the, um, the clinical quality measures screen, it opens those up first. Um, and j these are a list, most of them are, are commonly reported. Um, I'll be honest, we haven't had, I haven't personally run into any um, clinics that weren't able to find at least one, if not more, um, of these that they, that they were able to report on. Um, and so, you know, this, once again, is, is, is the list of those, and it is nice that it does um, sort of highlight those. However, all of the rest of the CQMs are right below that as well. So um, in many cases, you, you'd be reporting on one or more um, of these high priority ones, but then others um, you can select as well. Did anyone on the call have any questions or, or comments or, um, around the portal, or was there anything else, Janelle, that you wanted to highlight? I don't think I had anything else to highlight at this time about the portal. Okay. Did anyone on the call have a question or want to jump in? Um, Kevin, was there anything in the chat that we wanted to move to next? Hi, Lori. There's nothing in the chat at this time. Okay. You know, Janelle, um, while, while we're here, you know, one of the things that I know I receive an awful lot of questions and I, as well as others on the team do is around documentation requirements um, and making sure that you're uploading the correct documentation um, to, to the portal. Um, you know, one of the things that I just wanted to point out to everyone is that on, your, um, on the DHS website, um, it does really list out, and there's, um, I've actually made it into a checklist for myself um, just to make sure that um, you, all of your documentation requires 
has all of the elements required so that, you know, it, so that you are able to submit correctly and, and, and you're not getting a lot of questions later on. Um, Janelle, was there anything in particular that you wanted to, to highlight here? Um, sure. One of the things that I would say is pretty common, um, especially with the certified EHR technology documentation, a lot of times I see providers submit just the sort of print off from the chapel website that says, you know, here is your certified health IT, um, the certification number, um, and then it tells you the, the version number, the product name and the version number, and then sort of all of the different areas that it's been certified to, right? Right. That really is not, um, that's not something that I can use to verify that you have that system. The reason is I can go on to the chapel and generate that myself. It doesn't mean that I actually have the certified EHR system. So instead, what's really important is to give us something that is dated within the program year. So that's important. And also to remember, you might not be able to, to meet all of the requirements for documentation in one shot, right? Sometimes you need to give me two or three pieces of documentation to piece together so that I can see, yes, you did have this 2015 edition cert um, that you are attesting to on your application. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really important to give something that is dated within the program year and that shows, establishes that business relationship between your organization and um, the certified health IT product vendor. So that might be an invoice. It might be um, even an email string. If I can see clearly that it is from a vendor source and I can see the dates um, and, you know, it looks like a legitimate email string, I would accept that. Um, also, anything that um, is for those that are using certain, certain providers or certain vendors have created just um, sort of a, a document that they submit for meaningful use purposes. And so this might be a letter from your vendor um, where they've signed it, they've dated it, they've said, yep, this is the organization, um, they are using this product name and version number. So it's also really important that you give, um, you give documentation to show what is your product name and then what is that version number of the product? Because the version number is really important. It's really going to speak to, are you on the 2015 edition? Um, because the versions are what tell me sort of what edition you're on. Um, so I'd say those are the main things. If you are thinking that you're going to just upload the chapel page, please do reconsider and look for other documentation to give me because otherwise you will be getting a phone call uh, from a member of my team uh, to submit additional documentation, and that's just going to slow down your payments. So if you can get that on the front end, that would be great. Janelle, those are um, a number of really good points. Just a couple of things that I wanted to um, mention as well as things that I've seen in the field. Um, I think that your point around um, that many times it might be a couple of different pieces of information, um, so maybe your contract may not may have the vendor name, but not the product um, version number and, and things like that. And so it is good to sort of double check your documentation to make sure that you have all of it. It might be a combination of, let's say, a receipt together with a screenshot um, that clearly shows um, the version that you're using. Another thing, speaking of the chapel website, is that don't assume that the number that you used last year that you generated on the chapel website is necessarily the same one that you'd be using this year. Um, many times due to version changes and other changes, it's always good to go to the chapel website just to make sure that you do have the most recent um, chapel ID as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another area that I wanted to highlight is around the patient um, volume documentation requirements. Um, this is a question that we get um, very often. The other thing is, is that many times in our one-on-one -on -one TA, we'll actually um, work with clinics to make sure that they have this information. Um, there's two ways to report patient volume, and that is either by individual eligible professionals, 
um, or by group. Um, and the documentation is similar um, between the two. Um, and some of the ones that I, some of the things that I wanted to really highlight is the fact that it's important to have the, the date of service for um, each of the encounters, um, a unique patient identifier, which um, can be um, a patient name, a patient Medicaid ID, um, it can be some other type of patient identifier, but Janelle, correct me if I'm wrong, if it is an, a Medicaid um, patient, the Medicaid ID does need to be somewhere so that you can verify the, that this is indeed a Medicaid um, enrolled member, correct? Yes, if it, is, um, if it is a Medicaid encounter, we do need to see either the patient name or the Medicaid ID. I will always okay. prefer to see Medicaid ID because it's very simple then for me to match it up in my system. Um, okay. But if there's a situation where that is not possible, then we will accept patient name. Mm -hmm. um, but we cannot accept like an internal medical record number for a Medicaid patient encounter because I cannot verify that then. So I would need to see either the patient name or the Medicaid ID for all encounters that are attributed to Medicaid. The other alternative. They, mm -hmm, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, if you know, some organizations um, feel very strongly about not submitting patient names for non-Medicaid members or non-Medicaid encounters, I should say, in those cases, you may use an internal medical record number um, for, for those patients um, rather than their patient name. Um, those are for the non-Medicaid encounters. That's a good point. You know, as we're talking about patient volume as well, um, it's important to remember that unless you're a federal, federally qualified health center or an FQHC, you um, or a rural health center, you you are required to um, make sure to use the standard deduction, which for this year is four point um, four point one one percent. Um, and so I know that that's something that I need to always remind myself, as well as many time clinics, um, just to make sure that that is done so that you're accurately um, reporting patient volume as well. Um, did anyone have any other questions or comments around um, patient volume documentation or anything else? If not, you know, um, another topic that, um, I, that, that has caused um, a lot of confusion is around objectives six and seven. These are the two objectives. and. And for those of you, um, I, I am going to go ahead and also show on my screen what those measures and objectives are. So specifically, um, objective number six is the coordination of care through patient engagement. And this one, you must attest to all three measures. However, you only need to meet the um, thresholds on two. However, one thing that does get a little bit um, is uh, a little bit of, of a question is around the exclusion and the way that you report on these or the way you know that you've met the objective is very similar to um, public health. So meeting the exclusion does not mean that you've met the measure. Um, and for objective. Um, Seven in particular, I know that um, because this one is a bit different than it has been in the past, um, that that is particularly important. Um, and so think of it more in terms of how you would attest to public health, where an exclusion does not mean that you've met the measure. It just means that you need to either meet or exclude for the other measures. Janelle, did you have any tips around these two objectives or anything that you've noticed as, as people are attesting? Um, I mean, I think you did a pretty good job explaining, um, explaining this one. I would just say, you know, when, when we're thinking about it, it's either I have to meet two of them 
mm -hmm. or I have to meet what I can and exclude from everything else. So that's, that's, that's kind of the way that I think about this one. Um, and if you can't meet any of them, then the only way to satisfy it is if you are able to exclude from all three of them. Mm -hmm. um, if you are not able to exclude from all three of them and you're not able to meet at least two, then unfortunately you wouldn't meet the requirements for meaningful use for this year. Mm. And I know meeting uh, meaningful use or stage three is the objectives this year. Um, you know, there, there are some changes and some differences, some nuances in the um, objectives. So I did want to just open it up for any questions that people have or um, around the objectives or, or, or anything else that, that has kind of tripped you up. I know a lot of EHR vendors, unfortunately, didn't give real clear workflow guidance until late in the year. Um, and, and so I know that this has been challenging um, for many. So were there any questions or any comments that anyone on the line has? Well, hi, Lori, it's Gail. Hi, Gail. Hi. So, you know, the what, what, which, I don't know which one it is for sure, but which objective requires us to do the patient education? Mm-hmm. Which one right. is that? Let me see here. That one is, oh, just bear with me. I'm just going to, 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 to bring that one up. Um, what is your question around it while, while well, I'm yeah, so our doctors, that. like, we looked at that, oh. and they didn't really feel like that would be the literature that they would share with their patients about a particular type of visit. Mm -hmm. And so they were uncomfortable, like, saying, okay, well, here's the literature that we're sending you electronically because that's what we're told to do, but that's not what we would have given them as mm -hmm. a guidance or as additional information. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily agree with that viewpoint. And so, like, then we feel like should we, like, why do we have to, you know, we know why we have to, but... It feels mm -hmm. like there should be an alternative to that because, do you know what I mean? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah yes. And, um, Gail, your providers are not alone. I think here's, here's a few different things just to consider sort of steps that, that, that I'd recommend is, um, you know, see if there, um, see if there's, if your EHR allows any kind of, um, customization to what is allowed. Um, some of them are more flexible than others. So if you haven't already done so, that would be sort of step one, is see if um, whatever the doctor does like to use or the provider does like to use, um, see if that is something that, that you can add to the EHR or, um, or, or add to that so, so that it is something that, that can be provided. Um, not only in print, but also electronically, because that is what um, that objective requires, is that electronic sharing. Right, um, right. So you don't necessarily so, have to use what they have as the prescribed electronic um, literature. Well, here, um, it, it does need to be, um, it needs to come from or sort of be recommended by or, or, or within the EHR. Um, however, many EHRs do allow some customization around that. Okay, so let me um, find that out. Okay, I'll, I'll check that out with Green. Yeah, so, so that would be plan A. I will say plan B, let's just say that what you find, um, which is the case in some EHRs, that, that uh, customization either is very expensive or it's not really available, then the piece that I would really look at is see what is available. A, a lot of the EHRs, and see if there's anything that, that would be commonly used. Like, for example, um, I worked with a clinic where the providers really didn't like what was available around specific um, conditions or, you know, specific diagnoses. But they were um, they were in agreement, like the the 
um, material that was available around the medications um, they did feel was, was useful um, and they were okay with. And so um, in that particular clinic, what they did was they provided education around the um, medications and with that we're able to meet that threshold as well. Oh, so you're saying you don't have to do it for all visits, you can just do it for certain types of situations and as long meet as the threshold. threshold. As long as you meet the threshold. And, you know, so if, if you are going to sort of pick and choose, um, I would really make sure that, you know, with whatever it is you're choosing, you're able to meet the threshold. Um, okay. Another example is, um, well, uh, is at another clinic I worked with, they really liked the smoking cessation, um, but they didn't like the other <laughs> uh, educational materials. But because of their patient population, um, they were able to use that and, um, and meet the threshold. So it's really about that balance between, um, you know, what, what you're able to do with your EHR, um, what your clinic or, or your providers can, are, are like, yeah, I'm bored with, like, okay, these are decent resources or these are acceptable resources, and then, you know, just making sure you're doing it enough within that 90-day period to meet the threshold. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Great question. Did anyone else have any other questions? around that. All right, if not, um, I'm just going to bring up one more time um, the different areas um, of, of resources that, that I kind of have available here um, on this slide. And just so you know, the slide, um, or a link to handouts of the slides was uh, um, available in the reminder email that went out yesterday. If anyone does want me to email you this presentation with these that includes all of these links, please let me know and I'd be happy to do that as well um, because it does have a lot of common, um, common resources. You know, another one that a lot um, of clinics have found very helpful is around the prevention um, of information blocking. Um, that is uh, objective zero um, in the, the Forward Health portal. Um, and MediStar on, the, on our website has put together a tip sheet on what actions are required um, and sort of um, a little bit of a guide around um, you know, which you need to respond yes to to um, successfully demonstrate promoting interoperability. So I just wanted to highlight that resource as well. Did anyone else on the line have any questions or comments? Janelle, um, but before we get off the line here, you know, um, moving forward, you know, for many of us, uh, many clinics either have already finished attestation um, or, or are very close to doing so, or maybe unfortunately have found that, um, that, that they were not able to meet um, all of the stage three requirements this year. Just looking forward to 2020 and 2021, um, is there anything in particular you'd, you'd like to highlight? Yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, one thing I really want to point out is, you know, the, the Meaningful Use Program has been going for a while now. We're coming up on almost a decade, which means that program year 2021 is our final year. Um, and because of that, the way that the law is written, all incentives have to be paid out by December 31st of 2021. So I'm going to say that again. For program year 2021, all incentives must be paid by December 31st of 2021. Now, that, of course, is a bit different than any other program year, right? 
we're now yeah. in February, we're talking about program year 2019. That's our typical cadence. So program years 2020 and 2021, you will see some changes in what the cadence is for attestation and for selecting your, um, selecting your 90 day periods. Um, I can't speak to the specifics right now, but I can tell you that you should watch for our emails, you should watch the Forward Health, up, uh, the Forward Health website and our, our um, EHR incentive program, or excuse me, Promoting Interoperability program website. Um, we do expect to publish our policies on both years in the second quarter of this year. So somewhere between April and the end of June, you should see policies for both program years 2020 and 2021. Um, one thing I do want to also point out about program year 2021 is that um, CMS has shortened the sort of the, the available window for you to choose your reporting periods from and it's also given states the way to shorten that even further if they need, um, they need the time for processing applications. So um, according to CMS, October 31st is the final day. Um, that you could have an EHR reporting period run to in 2021. So you would have to choose a 90-day period from January 1st to October 31st of 2021. Um, again, that's CMS's requirement, and then they've also given states additional flexibility. So I'm just going to urge you to watch for our policy updates where we will spell out what the, what the program dates are um, for, for in Wisconsin. Um, we will plan to do some additional outreach on this. So, you know, you might be getting more emails than you're used to, or you might be getting some phone calls. Wait, um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that question. Okay, maybe that wasn't really a question. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just wanted to point out that, you know, they'll, they'll sort of be expedited. Um, you know, in, especially in program year 2021. And, um, you know, Lori and I were talking about what this, what this means for you all, and that would really mean that um, if you have plans to participate through the end of the program, I mean, one, I would encourage you, for those of you who are, you know, who have providers that only have one year left, I would encourage you to finish it up, try to finish up in 2020. Um, try to have 2020 be your last program year. That way you're insured to get all of your payments, um, you know, and it, it would be, I think, a little less, um, a little less nerve-wracking, perhaps, than you know, waiting till the final program year. So I would say, one, if you can finish up in 2020, do so. Um, we would really encourage people to do that. Um, but if you do plan to attest in 2021, you really are going to need to look at, you know, how can I meet the requirements in right. quarter one or quarter two of 2021. Janelle, excellent point. You know, as we look ahead, I know this is something um, that the team here at Metastar is most certainly um, going to also stay very, very on top of. But for 2021 in particular, you know, I think that it, it, it behooves everyone to really look at um, as early in the year as possible, even for 2020. You know, um, if you are in a situation that maybe um, you weren't able to get all of the uh, workflows um, really completely implemented in order to meet all of the stage three measures in 2019. You know, there's no reason why not to really focus um, on quarter one or quarter two, um, you know, of 2020 to really make sure that those are in place um, so that, you know, you, you are assured that, that, that you are able to um, attest successfully in 2020, um, because 2021, I think, is going to be a very, very tight year. Um, and, you know, sometimes workflows change, and um, it's not going to give people a lot of of, of time. The other thing is, is that I'm talking about Q1, Q2. I also just wanted to make sure that everyone um, just remembers that uh, the 90-day reporting period does not need to fall within a quarter, um, nor the first of the month. It can be any 90 days. Um, and 
Um, and, and so I just wanted to make make that clear as well. Thanks so much for that update, um, Janelle. Is there anyone on the line who has any questions about 2021 or, or anything else um, related to the Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Program? This is Stacy. I do have a quick question. If we had a provider that attested for four years and then didn't hit the patient volume for a year, can we go back and continue attesting even though we lost that sequence? Stacy, that is a great question, and the answer is yes. Um, as long you do not, it does not need to be a consecutive six years that um, a provider participates um, in the Promoting Interoperability um, Incentive Program. So if you do have that case, um, and this year they are able to meet the, um, the patient volume, then most certainly you would be able to um, successfully attest for them as long as they are meeting all of the stage three requirements. Does that answer your question? That does answer it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Janelle, did you have anything to add? I don't think so. I think mm -hmm. it was a good question and good answer. <laughs> yeah. All right. Does anyone else have any questions? You know, I did just want to point out one other thing that, one other question or one other topic here, um, and that is public health reporting. There has been, um, in stage three, there has been a little bit of, of a change. Um, electronic case reporting is now also available um, here in the state of Wisconsin. And for anyone who does have any questions, I did want to point out that the state of Wisconsin does have a very good resource that really helps um, determine uh, what you're able to report on and, um, and what the exclusions are as well. Um, and this really has become my uh, go-to guide <laughs> um, on all things um, regarding um, public health reporting. Um, and specifically, the electronic case reporting um, is measure number, that's the public health registry reporting, um, cancer data, and then also um, the electronic, um, the clinical data reporting as well. So I just wanted to um, highlight that, um, that that resource. Did anyone have any questions, or Janelle, did you have any other comments around around that? Um, I guess the only thing I would say for the um, for the clinical data registry reporting right. measure, I mm -hmm. have received a question about sort of what standards are required for use, um, and I would I would refer people to the CMS specification sheet. Um, at the, at the bottom of the specification sheet, there's an additional information section, and they, they explicitly talk about this question. Um, basically, there, there does have to be some standards used. Um, what, it, what they do is they say it has to be some standards that are, that are stated at um, a specific spot in the regulation. So um, it has to be some sort of standardized document that's uh, or document format, um, whether that might be a CCD um, or it might be um, uh, um, like a QRDA file. I mean, there, there's, there's a variety of files that have a specified standard out there. So there's not just a single standard that must be used for the clinical data registry reporting, but it does need to be in some sort of standard. It can't be um, just a proprietary type standard. So I would just refer people to the CMS specification sheet on that. Um, and, you know, I can work, you know, with Lori to provide further details if, if you guys want to push out information about that at all. Um, you know, you do have to get onto the, like, ECFR, the, um, uh, the federal regulation website and kind of 
kind of get through there, but um, you know, but they do they do very clearly indicate which portions um, of that federal reg need to be referred to. So um, we can certainly provide additional information on that, but I did just want to mention that there is some some level of standard is required, um, but there's flexibility in what that standard is. Absolutely, and I just wanted to point out to everyone that, as Janelle mentioned, it is right at the bottom of that of that spec sheet. Probably from a practical standpoint, I think the first place I would go is to your EHR vendor um, to to understand um, that portion of it. But reach out to us, and, and we'd be happy to sort of um, help field any questions sort of. A, Align that line as well as um, with the Wisconsin, you know, on the Wisconsin side, for example, with the Wisconsin Immunization Registry, we do have a staff member right there that is is able to help with with these kinds of questions and concerns. Very good. Were there before we sign off here? Are there any other questions or any other comments um, from anyone on the line? Okay. If not, first I just wanted to say thank you to everyone um, for joining us today, and I also wanted to say thank you so much, Janelle, for providing your insight and, and providing information and answering questions as well. Have yeah, a, you're welcome. Have Happy to great help. Great day, and I also just wanted to point out that here is our contact information as well. If you do think of anything that we didn't cover, please feel free to reach out to us. Very good. Have a great day.